So we just learned that the exponential of a matrix can be used to solve autonomous linear differential equations. But for non-autonomous linear ordinary differential equations, which are typically of the form x dot equals, and let me now put the time explicit, because our solutions depend on some parameter t, and now our matrix also depends on t. So in this situation, we have some interval, and our matrix is an m by m matrix, um, let's, let's say with real coefficients. And it depends on a time parameter. And we're just going to focus on the time parameter being in some closed interval, because we don't necessarily know if, we able, if we'll be able to solve an ODE like this for all t. So we're just going to assume that we have a matrix that depends on some fixed amount of time in some closed interval. And the ODE is of this form. And again, we have some initial condition. But this time, our initial condition um, is just the initial uh, position x at a. Well, if we interpret x to be position, but again, these could be um, just arbitrary variables. So uh, it's actually going to be funny how we solve this system. So you might say uh, this is totally useless. But um, we can actually rewrite this ODE in the following way by integrating. And we can write it as an integral equation that looks like this. So it's the initial condition plus the integral from a to b of a s x s ds. And you can check that this ODE with this initial condition is equivalent to this integral equation. All we have to do is take the derivative. Oh, I see I made a mistake here. This should be a t. All we have to do is take the derivative here with respect to t. This constant term drops out. This just gives us plugging in a of t, plugging in t into s, the s variable. And that gives me x of t. Uh, the derivative of x of t equals a t x t. So it gives me exactly this. And our initial condition is that x of t equals a gives me exactly this because this term is 0 since we're integrating over a single point. And that has no area. So its Riemann integral is 0. Um, so let me do something funny. And the funny thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take xs and plug in this integral equation back into xs. So this I can rewrite as x of a plus integral t a a s. And now let me write again this integral equation again, but replacing xt with xs. So it's x a plus integral up to s now from a. And now I need another dummy variable, so let me just call it um, r, let's say. So x r dr, close parentheses, and this I'm integrating with respect to s. Looks like everything is so much more complicated. Now I have two integrals. And even though we didn't talk about multi-dimensional integrals, um, every calculation here is done by just calculating a usual integral. So um, if I write this, the following shorthand notation is going to make that a little bit, it's going to look a little bit more complicated because it has all these integrals. But we can reduce them to single integrals. So that ds comes out plus, and now I have two integrals one that goes from a to t and one that goes from a to s. And this one's a s. Then here I have a r. And then x r dr ds. Looks like I just have a worse equation. Well, let's do it again. <laughs> you might wonder, why on earth would anybody do this? It looks like we're just making the situation significantly more complicated. But now let me skip some steps. So let me skip the step where we actually explicitly write it out. And then I'll write what you get after you do this. You can maybe see a pattern already.
So it's the same thing. Notice that I'm actually going to get the same thing appearing um, once. And then I'm going to get another term. Oh, with one difference. The variable here, I've plugged in xa. Right? You've noticed that. So let me now, this is actually an xa. And then we have a third term that now has three integrals. Now I'm running out of letters. Um, let's use Q. So it looks like things are getting way, way, way more complicated, but an important observation is the following, and it's that xa, our initial condition, is always appearing in the first n minus 1 integrals, and only the variable appears at the very end. So our integral equation, in some sense, what we're doing is we're pushing our variable, our unknown the thing that we want to solve for, off further and further after, multi after several iterations of this. So what we're doing is we're keeping our initial condition and we're pushing off the unknown solution, in some sense, off to infinity. So let me rewrite this as the identity plus everything here. Since xa doesn't depend on s, I can pull that out of the integral, but I have to remember that this is an integral of a matrix. And by the way, the integral of a matrix just means the integral of each of its components. I should have mentioned that earlier, but it's not a complicated definition. You just integrate each component in the usual way. Plus integral t a s ds plus, and I'm going to put my initial condition all the way out on the right. So this is a double integral now. And then, oh, dr ds. And then my initial condition appears on the right. If I did this correctly, yeah, they have three. xa plus the other term. And I'm not going to rewrite that one because um, I would just be rewriting exactly the same thing. So you notice that if I keep recursively applying this, I'm going to get 1 plus integral of a plus 2 integrals of a. And notice where my um, bounds go. And then if I did this again, I would get plus something with three integrals of a. I would actually get this term with xq replaced by x at a. And then my next term would have four integrals. So I can sort of write, and I'll, let me write this as equals because we don't yet know if this even makes sense. I can write 1 plus a certain number of integral terms. And all I'm doing is I'm adding up. And in fact, I can even write this as strictly equals because I'll do a finite case first. Um, let's do n many integrals. So here, n equals 1, n equals 2. And we'll do this. So let's start with k equals 1 all the way up to n. And we will integrate from a to t. A, and now let's use a, a smart choice of variable. Let's call it s1. And then this goes from a to s1, because that's what appears here, a s2, and so on, up until a s k, that's what we're going to call it, k, uh, minus 1, I believe. So this will be a s k. And then I have all of my ds's. So this is ds k all the way down to ds1. All of this applied to our initial condition, which I don't have space to write it, um, is x of a plus the term that's left over is has n plus 1 many integrals. So I can write this as, and by the way, sk, when this equals 0, I just mean t. 
Um, so plus, and then I have a term that looks just like this, but has n plus 1 many integrals instead of just n many integrals. But our last term, sn plus 1, x, sn plus 1 also, dsn plus 1, all the way down to the last term. And this is sn, and this is a. So it looks something like this. And here, again, is our the function that we want to solve for. But if you notice, all of these terms don't have that function anymore. And so what you would hope would happen is that in the limit, as n goes to infinity of this expression, that this term here gets pushed off. And we can essentially ignore it. And our solution would just be this first part. And so it turns out that this works. So it's a fact that this term, identity plus this large sum, n k equals 1, let's take the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression. And I won't write everything. I mean this term exactly here. A s k plus minus 1. ASK, DSK, down to DS1. If I take 1 and then sum all of this over all n, this converges. Which is, which is surprising. I mean, this is a very complicated uh, sum of many, many integrals. And eventually, we're integrating, uh, you can in some sense think, infinitely many times. Um, but nevertheless, this sum converges for all continuous functions here. And not only does it converge, furthermore, and by the way, since it converges, let's give it a name. Let's call it P from A to t of a, of our matrix a. And this is called the time-ordered exponential of a. And furthermore, the solution to our initial ODE is x of t is the time-ordered exponential of a. That's going to be an m by m matrix applied to our initial condition. And this actually solves our linear, non-autonomous ODE. And if you thought calculating the exponential of an ordinary matrix was difficult, try calculating this.